the Copenhagen interpretation, which states that the act of measurement affects the system. Please. The Penrose interpretation, which suggests that the wave function collapsed. Just to confirm, yes, you're in the right place. This is Skeptico. This is yet another movie clip I'm playing for you. This is from Devs, a series on Netflix. Like, this is really super duper mainstream. And, like, right off the bat, they are talking about the most fundamental issues of consciousness, AI how robots are going to take over the world, which, of course, that's true, but also how robots may be creating a simulation that we're living in and all the rest of that shit, that if you're into that stuff, you'd better be into it. It's the biggest thing, right? And it's directly, directly relevant to this amazing interview I have coming up with Andrew Smart, who's written a book on all this. So back to the clip. I want to talk to you about the von neumann wigner interpretation, which states that human consciousness is the key modifier in decoherence. Are you fucking kidding? Katie. You're offering a lecture on von neumann wigner Are you serious? Half the people in this room are undergrads. They might actually believe what you're saying. There are many interesting conjectures within the theory. It's dual is bullshit, which is the worst kind of bullshit. Okay, so there's like five different clips I could play for you from this upcoming interview with Andrew Smart, but I'm going to kind of confine it very narrowly in this introduction, even though we talk about all the really important shit like is Google the belly of the beast that has an unrelenting chokehold on our freedom and way of life as we know it. We address that quite directly in this, as we do uh, demonetization, but also, you know, social justice and search and the responsibility and scale, which is really the issue, you know, I mean, Google does have a problem, trillions of searches, so they have a certain responsibility there that they're going to need some flexibility on handling, even if they have to use Gestapo tactics to do it. I, I'm flavoring this. It's it's really a good interview. It's a fair, balanced interview, and I super appreciate and respect this guy, Andrew Smart, who you're going to hear from. But here's a clip, and then we'll roll right into the interview. The idea is that will these AGIs will be just like human minds. They'll literally be minds, and and so the, the the thought about LSD was then well, if it's if it's basically indistinguishable from a human mind, it you know it's like how you would engineer a system that could be perturbed by LSD. What I think has been the core question here a lot of times, and I think is this question is skirted for the most part by the technology community. And that is, is it the Turing test or is it the metaphysical test? The question about consciousness is, is it somehow fundamental? Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Karras. And I have a terrific guest for you today. His name is Andrew Smart. He's the author of a book uh, from a few years ago, but certainly an important, relevant book, Beyond Zero and One, Machines, Psychedelics, and Consciousness. Let me read for you a little bit of background on Andrew. You're going to be blown away. I have a broad yet deep background in science, engineering, and technology. I specialize in the areas of brain imaging, neurotechnology, human-computer interaction, human factors, data visualization, and statistical analysis. I'm primarily interested in the disciplinary intersections among cognitive science, computer science, artificial intelligence, anthropology, philosophy, and human factors. Now, as impressive as that sounds, I would suggest that Andrew is being somewhat modest. I mean, when you look him up, uh, let me pull this up, on Google Scholar, I mean, man, a lot of peer-reviewed, very important papers. And, and then certainly, if you look him up on LinkedIn, I'm not going to go there, but I mean, he is, uh, you know, very, very well positioned at Google, worked at Twitter before that, you know, really belly of the beast kind of jobs, Honeywell as well, but we're going to talk all of that. So 
I'm very, very grateful that Andrew has joined us today to talk about this book and other stuff. Andrew, thanks for being here. No, th thanks for having me on. I, I'm a little embarrassed by the introduction, but <laughs> thanks. <laughs> There, there is absolutely no way you should be. I, I really wish you would do uh, more interviews. I'd love to hear more of that. But uh, hey, well, I got, a, I got a shot here, so uh, I can't, I can't complain. So t t tell us, you know, let's start with the book, Beyond Zero and One. Tell folks, you know, what they're going to find. Yeah, well, um, like you mentioned, the book is is maybe five or six years old. I, it's hard to remember now um, in our weird, you know, time warp of, of COVID. <laughs> but uh, I, so, yeah, you know, I've I've long had this interest in in philosophy of mind and and AI, and um, had been following the debates about it ever since I was a student and. Um, you know, I've, and like you, like you mentioned, I've worked in cognitive science and then different, um, you know, brain imaging labs. And I was, um, at the time when I started writing the book, I was working at um, Novartis, which is a big, big pharma company in Switzerland. Uh, but it's actually where um, LSD was first synthesized when, when it used to be called Sandoz, where Albert Hoffman worked. And I, it turned out I was working for a time in the same building where Hoffman's lab used to be in the 1940s. Let me interject something to, to set this uh, yeah. up because maybe I put you yeah. too much on the spot and, and did it. I mean, when I say belly of the beast, man, I mean, anyone who's into this stuff, like the connections that just in your life are kind of like a little, cause right, like what everyone, yeah. the controversy is, Andrew here is, a, a, a minion of the robots who are going to take over the world, right? I mean, th right. Th that is like that. That is like one way to couch this. You know, this sure. is the guy who's developing the strong AI robots, which we know are going to have a greater and greater. You know, I'll tone it down a bit. A greater and greater influence on everything, whether it's law or whether you go see a therapist, a doctor, or whether you trade right. stocks or any of this stuff, we all understand that artificial intelligence is, so when you just mentioned two words, you just said the controversy surrounding this, I just want to frame up and make sure everyone understands that this is like, for people who are into this, this is like, like one of the, the most important issues, a lot bigger than a lot other yeah. yeah okay so go ahead Com please continue because now we're back to the belly yeah, the in the the lsd thing is super super genius the way you weave that into the whole book so go ahead i'm sorry oh sure no no problem. yeah no well yeah we can get to the my my job at, at google which is actually not i'm you know like i'm, I'm actually trying to constrain or or do some sort of risk assessments of those things that you just mentioned but we can um anyway i so if if people are familiar with the debates around agi or what they call artificial general intelligence and super intelligence and this is um this is it's it's still definitely a, a debate in the field about you know you you have a general purpose model that can do anything really and you and because now the way machine learning is developed is you, they have specific tasks and they're not especially good in areas when you you know if you develop a, a thing that's supposed to detect a certain type of image and then you you use it in the real world it often fails um, if it if it sees something that it's not used to in its in its distribution but anyway there there's been a long strand of of work on this question of superintelligence and AGI and human level artificial intelligence. And there's a, there's a niche there of philosophers like David Chalmers, for example, who have been thinking about consciousness a lot and whether this AGI would be conscious. Like, uh, and, and that, that was the, the interesting part to me was this, the, and in the debates about AGI, consciousness is still quite taboo. Like people, it, it's um, it's like a side issue that people well, don't. as you as you point out in the book, and I forget the exact quote, but you said a lot of AI engineers question whether it's even relevant. I mean, so it's right. it's it's not even, you know, philosophically okay, but who cares, you know? Right. And 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 just uh, 
tiny bit on my background. So I I do have an AI background. So I, I, I was a research associate at Arizona, and then I started an AI company, MindPath Technologies, and we built these expert systems for DuPont and Texas Instruments with this idea that we would, you know, somehow capture all the knowledge that these gold badgers had and, you know, preserve it. And it didn't, and it didn't, and none of it worked very good. But I'm familiar with the thing. I'm familiar with the issues. And uh, it was really, cr I don't want to say it was crappy, but I mean, where AI is at now, you know, like uh, AlphaGo. So like, it's almost like you have to have seen the movie AlphaGo and know the whole thing to even kind of enter into this conversation. Because what it's doing is kind of catapulted us to another level. I mean, before that, it was Big Blue and can AI beat the best chess player in the world. And now we're just, we're just way, way past that, folks. And like, those issues are like way in the distance. And what Andrew is at the cutting edge of is, okay, these things are really, really smart. Uh, you know, how smart could they possibly get? And you pose this question, again, that kind of catapults us five steps beyond that. Can we build a robot that trips on acid? So you tell us how you jump three steps ahead and say, screw the, the, the Turing test. This is the acid Turing test. Well, I, I did, so, and this is a weird, like you were mentioning, like a weird confluence of, of things in my life where, you know, I had come from this sort of cognitive science AI background where I was studying and working and then I had, I had moved to Basel in Switzerland to work at this company to work on, on medical tech. Um, and then, you know, I, um, I, on the tram one day, actually, I, I just, ha I was, had been reading stuff and then, you know, I just had that thought like you have in the shower, like, you know, what, what, what if, what could an AI trip on a, you know, I had been reading about a lot about psychedelics. I have my own, you know, I used, I've explored psychedelics in, in my past and, and I had read Albert Hoffman's book and I found the whole history of, of LSD super fascinating and it's it's kind of a lost history especially in main, in mainstream culture you know it's it's a very un, underappreciated story can you talk about that a little bit because I think your insights in that or your, your telling of that history is super important and it's brilliant because it goes beyond psychedelic experience right it it, it changes the way we think about cognitive science and neuroscience that that's really important I hope can you share that well, sure, yeah, and well, and so the, um, you know, so Albert Hoffman was this Swiss chemist, and you know, working at was what was then Sando in, in Basel, and you know, they were he was a, a you know, like a, a chemist at a at a pharma company working on drug discovery, you know, like synthesizing new compounds, you know, trying to find things that were medically relevant and active. He had been working with a series of different different derivatives of um, of fungus and fungi and this you know that actually it's kind of a toxic thing if you if you get too much of it but he and I, I think originally they were working on sort of respiratory they thought this was good for respiratory issues and you know he so he he had been working on this and the story is that at you know at some point he was had synthesized a bunch of these different compounds and the 25th one that that he, LSD 25 as, as it was called, somehow in the lab one day he accidentally got some in his system. I don't. Nobody knows quite. Got on his hand, got in his eye, but he had about an hour or two where he saw these vivid colors. He felt really strange. He had the strange episode. He initially thought maybe this was chloroform that he had accidentally ingested because they used that as a solvent. And but then he. He thought this was really odd, so he went home, and then he's he's he said, "Well, maybe it is this stuff, this this lysergic acid, diethylalamide." And so he planned a self experiment uh, for the. So he went home, and then he's like, and so he, then he synthesized some more, and he he thought he was just making this the tiniest dose that would do anything. He didn't even think this would do anything, and it turned out this is actually a pretty, you know, a pretty good, <laughs> a pretty good dose. So. He ate it and then he had, you know, the famous, then he tried to ride his bike home from the lab because he started like, what's, you know, he really thought he was going to die. He was seeing devils and, see, you know, and he, and he has, you know, he, he writes that he, he tried to ride his bike home. He had no memory of moving on his bike, but suddenly he was at his house. <laughs> and anyway, <clears throat> he had this kind of, you know, the first acid trip. And that's why we call it an acid trip because he was, 
you know this this the famous bicycle trip and actually every year in Basel there's a on the on the date when this happened there's a bicycle tour from around Basel to I didn't where he's know that. yeah um it's it's kind of a but so he then he reported this to his superiors and they were all skeptical and he was like well try some <laughs> and you know everyone realized like this is a very potent thing because it was such a tiny amount of active stuff that gave you a, a trip for you know eight twelve hours um and yeah, that 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 started a whole a real serious drug development. You know, they did animal studies, they did human studies. Um, it it looked really promising for treating alcoholism, for treating depression. There were thousands and thousands of studies done and papers written. Um, and then you know the what what he and he really intended it to be a serious psych you know psychiatric treatment, and he wanted to to develop you know, and so he was actually really dismayed with. You know, he, I, and he resented very much the hippie movement in the United States for, and he resented uh, Leary for deep. You know what I mean for under for undermining the sure. seriousness of of the of the drug. Like he didn't want it to be a party drug, which it kind of entered the the culture in that way, and then it got banned, and then research on it just completely stopped. And so anyway, that's it, it's terrific because I'll tell you, there's one other aspect of this that I learned from you. And I thought it was really just a great insight. What you point out is it opened up all these vistas in terms of even thinking about all the stuff that we now consider relevant. Sure. I mean, yeah. And, and I, as far as, you know, as, as reading the history of this, I think prior to LSD, there people didn't really think that that what's going on chemically in your brain had anything to do with how you feel or how your behavior. And then LSD was really like, oh, okay, we we just introduced this molecule into your synapses and like all this crazy stuff happens. Maybe so. Then you had you know then it Prozac and Ritalin and and that and and I think LSD was really kind of the entryway into more serious I mean people had known about stim you know of course stimulants and and things but there really wasn't a, a good a, a very advanced understanding of exactly what these different kinds of molecules are doing at the you know at the neural level I mean we still don't we we our, I think our understanding is quite crude but like LSD was really kind of the gateway to like Oh, we can do, we can work on compounds that target specific brain, you know, neurotransmitters and change how people feel, change how they behave. And L I think LSD was really, and that's a, that's kind of a lost uh, piece of medical history too. Absolutely, because it's, absolutely. LSD became such a crazy taboo in the United States, you know, and, it, and it, around the world. Yeah. And then what your book traces is like, okay, so that's one gateway, and then AI and its power to kind of do stuff that we think is pretty smart, you know, and play chess and go, don't, don't play online poker, people. You're playing against robots. You're just going to get wiped out. But I, I kid, but I, not really. Where you're going then is to say, okay, so in the way that these guys had their world blown about, wow, there's this chemical neuro interaction that I don't even – freaking understand and I didn't understand consciousness to begin with, but now I don't understand it even more Then you come along or AI comes along and says, yeah, you really don't understand consciousness. And then what you pose here, which is such an important question is again, I'll, I'll repeat it. Can we build a robot that trips on acid? And in the book, you say the Turing acid test. So talk about a little bit about Alan Turing, because this really is still for a lot of people, and, and it's going to be a very central part of this dialogue we're going to have today. You know, what is the Turing test? And is it really reasonable for you to push the Turing test to the uh, LSD level? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I, it's, and this, uh, and part of the, the fun of writing a book like this is you can be very speculative and, and thought experimenting with, you know what I mean? And it's, it's, I, I fully acknowledge it's, it's a speculative argument, but I was, I mean, what I was interested in was a lot of like, so A, there's a lack of discussion of consciousness in the AGI world. It's like, we're gonna create these human level intelligences 
and people don't really and and to and to me and and you know coming from a bit more of a, a human cognitive science background philosophy of mind where consciousness is a central problem for a lot of thinkers and there's this and you know what is the relationship between intelligence and consciousness and so i was questioning like can you have a human level intelligence that's not conscious i was re- i'm very i'm still very skeptical of that like i don't and 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 so in even in neuroscience, we don't know what the relationship is between intelligence, whatever that is, and consciousness, whatever that is. <laughs> so I I wanted to take, but then I did want to take the the sort of strong AI thesis that were made that, you know, the idea is that will these AGIs will be just like human minds. They'll literally be minds. And and so the the, the thought about LSD was then, well, if it's if it's basically indistinguishable from the human mind it it must have it must it must have this other property of like you must be able to alter it through these the you know it, it was it, it's a leap and you know it's like how you would engineer a system that could be perturbed by lsd or like and and but this gets back to these debates in philosophy of mind about you know there's the functionalist thing where it's like the medium if it's biological neurons or silicon-based artificial neurons, doesn't matter. It's the, what's important is what the way that they're set up and the algorithms that run. That that's what is conscious. And then there's other thinkers who are like, no, 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 no. Only biological systems can do this. And the and the AI people are like, no, no, no. Biology is irrelevant. And so I was I I thought LSD was a very interesting like way to like probe like probe that assumption of biology is irrelevant it's like um can you have all the properties of a human mind without this other property of like you can you can you can give it lsd and and it'll it'll change completely change the way your brain is operating for for a while or maybe or maybe for a longer time (laughs) it's very exciting it's a very imaginative way of of kind of framing the problem. If I can go back, I just want to make sure that we don't lose everybody. You know, the the Turing test was basically, you know, as you were kind of alluding to there, it's like, if I can fool you into thinking I'm intelligent, then I'm intelligent. And and that that then becomes the standard throughout, you know, so if we're sitting across and we're doing a chat, and you think I'm a human, uh, and I'm not, then I've passed the Turing test, you know, and then we keep extending that beyond and beyond. And as you point out, as you just pointed out, the thought exercises, though, they're going a lot of different directions. But where you took it with the acid thing or the LSD thing, I think really gets to what I think has been the core question here a lot of times. And I think is this question is skirted for the most part by the technology community. And that is, is it the Turing test or is it the metaphysical test? The question about consciousness is, is it somehow fundamental? So, you know, back when quantum physics happens, if you will, you got some of the greatest scientists, physicists of the world, the Max Planck's, the Schrodinger's, the Niels Bohr, they're saying, fuck it, guys, you got it all wrong. Consciousness is fundamental and matter, which you guys like or are so interested in, you AI guys are so interested in, is is somehow, emerging is a bad word, is somehow coming out of consciousness. And now I, I have to add that this really needs to be something that we wrestle to the ground too because on this show i mean i got 200 shows exploring that and i think the best way to explore that is through looking at some of the fundamental uh, questions assumptions we've made about consciousness start with does consciousness survive death so go look at the near-death experience science go look at university of virginia and the reincarnation science go look at all that and you come back and go okay yeah kind of pretty well case closed, consciousness seems to survive bodily death, and that would definitely throw us in the metaphysical camp. So uh, how do we even hold on to the materialist science, consciousness Mm. is an illusion? I mean, is that really viable from a philosophical standpoint, or not just philosophical, given the evidence we have? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's an interesting, and I I haven't thought too much about that 
in tr- you know, in terms of those questions, it's definitely like in the book, I was, I was kind of trying to argue against the, the inherent dualist, I think, tone in a lot of the AI thing where like consciousness can be Im- uh, embodied in any medium or, you know, if, if it's Silicon and I don't, and yeah, I, th- that's a, um, I don't know what I think about, you know, consciousness surviving death and like, I'm, I'm not, you know what I mean? Like I'm not, I don't have a strong. Let me ask you this question though about that. I'm going to persist on that a little bit further. Yeah. Isn't that the question? I mean, if, if we were going to not, but not the question, not like, Oh my God, I have to know if I, but from the standpoint of reducing it down to the kind of most parsimonious way to determine one or another. I mean, I think that's pretty, that's how I got there. I didn't start there with that question. I started with psi and parapsychology and how do those guys at Princeton get that random number generator to swing a little bit more 50, 50 that way. And then I got to some point I go, well, we'll screw all that. I mean, here's the more, here's the simplest question. Does consciousness survive death? If consciousness survives this bodily biological thing, well then, you know, it kind of answers that question. So philosophically, right. doesn't that question kind of cut to the chase? Yeah, I mean, and it's true. I think you're, it's a great point because you, it kind of has to if you imagine that you can do it in a machine. You know, it, you, it has to. You, you have to assume it. It does transcend the bio, like your biological brain. If 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 it can be instantiated in a different, yeah. And so it's a very good point, and it's a it's a very it's an interest, you know, and I, I agree. I mean, there's, you know, Camus was like, the, the only serious philosophical question is suicide. And exactly. Right. If you, if you think your life is worth living, that's, you know, everything else is kind of a game, he thought, you know. <laughs> so I, I don't, um, I have to say, like, philosophically, I tend, you know, I do tend toward more this tradition of, I guess, realism or like science, you know what I mean? The, the, the objects of scientific theories are, and, you know, I, I don't, I'm not, you know, I, but I would, I would definitely lean toward this, like, there's, there's some mind independent world and science tells us something about it <laughs> that in the, in the vaguest, weakest form of that argument. But I, but I completely acknowledge that that's a, a met, that that's a metaphysics in itself, you know, where you say, right. Science is about trying to understand the the some and and I agree like you were talking about the the quantum thinkers uh, and and quantum physics where that it does throw all that into question you know where you, you can't really separate what you're observing from the act of uh, observing <laughs> like there's no the, so but I I, I gotta <clears throat> return to I because I think you've added a really really important like you said thought experiment exercise with the acid thing and I want to return to that. What is your final conclusion on that in terms of playing that game? Is there some future where some artificial intelligence, could it pass the acid Turing test? Well, I, yeah, and I think this problem of, of people working, there's people you know that are interested in AGI and who are working on it, you know, and are, tr- are, are really trying to create this a human level, you know, system that, that has human level intelligence. And I, you know, and again, this, this question of would that thing, would that thing, whatever it is, have subjective experience or what con- some kind of, and I, you know, I definitely think a way to probe that would be to try to perturb it the way, the way LSD perturbs our subjective experience. Like it, it completely, you know, and but there's 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 a very difficult way, and this is what, what's very interesting to me is it's really hard to objectively verify that like you're tripping on acid. You you they they do studies now where they give people LSD or psilocybin, put them in the brain scanner, in the fMRI machine, and you lay there and you re- you report what you're like. Oh, I'm seeing colors. I feel disembodied. My ego's dissolving. And they can track, you know, then you can, you can definitely track like, okay, your, your anterior cingulate is shutting down, your prefrontal cortex is shutting down, your, 
you know what I mean? Like you, you can, and yeah. then they can compare like a person who's not on, who's sober and, and you can get an idea of what's going on in the brain, but how this relates to the, the subject of experiences is still very, you know, you can rely, like they do these studies where they try to reliably correlate like this brain, this is happening in this brain region and this is what the subject reports are reporting. But, and so in a computer system, again, you'd have the same problem of the computer <laughs> system might be claiming, it might be saying, hey, I'm conscious, don't hurt me. How would, do you, do you, you know what I mean? Like you're, here's where I thought you were going with that when you started talking about the imaging stuff, because this is very kind of yeah. uh, an interesting topic in the consciousness field, right? Is because they do that imaging stuff, that fMRI stuff. And Nutt, I think, is the guy's name in England who really kind of yep, started David, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. David yeah. Nutt, is that it? Yeah, David Nutt. Well, <laughs> what they found is very counterintuitive. I mean, the the uh, uh, subjective experience of tripping on psilocybin is, you know, boom, fireworks are going off. So the expectation was we'd see the brain lit up like a Christmas tree. And what they find is the opposite. They find a reduced activity in all these areas. And it supports the notion, which I, I, I don't know how this fits into your model, is that, you know, this is kind of this transceiver, you know, the brain is a transceiver of consciousness. Consciousness is vast, immense, mm -hmm. beyond we and can describe, right. and we're somehow right. filtering it through this. So when you talk about perturbing the system, you know, the AI system that is now instantiated in this little bit of silicone, we still come back to the same question is that God is up there running consciousness and flowing it through all these things. What difference does it make? Right. I, so I, yeah, I see what you mean. Like if, if, if consciousness is somehow a force in, you know, like a fundamental force or something that we are, you know, connecting to some, you know, via whatever, or like, and then, the psilocybin is in a, is like allowing that more. You, you mean to sort of explain the counter the counterintuitive thing right. about the, the the brain studies and like I mean I do I definitely think that there's that it's a little more nuanced because I think there's there's like um, in some of those studies you see there's specific regions that of the brain that reduce their activity in in the according to these measures but there are others that actually that are increasing and their and their connections are increasing and these and these are more the perceptual sensory i mean which again it doesn't rule out you know what i mean that that you're picking up stuff um and again this this is a very old philosophical debate about whether i mean i think within mainstream neuroscience it's it's generally accepted or assumed that the the you know the brain is it's identity. It is. It generates consciousness, or you know. But this is the people. People, you know, they're like, what is it? Ooze? Does it ooze, or what? You know, and this is this is a hard a hard debate about like what the. But there there definitely are philosophers. There there are you know, philosophers who talk about like the extended mind and like. I don't really think it's much of a debate if you really look at the frontier science. We're going to hold on yeah. to this materialism because. As Richard Feynman famously said, you know, shut up and calculate. And he didn't really say it, but why not attribute to him? It's it fits him. And, you know, we've built this incredible, incredible, advanced, scientifically based culture that we love and we should love because it brings us a lot of things and that, you know, shut up and calculate model. So we don't want to throw that for practical reasons, we don't want to throw that away. But from right. if we're going to be honest about the science, like I say, I mean, near death experience science, let alone parapsychology blows it away. But then if you want to get into the more human reincarnation research, you know, hey, after death communication, I just, you know, I interviewed this woman, Dr. Julie Bashel, she's still around at Winbridge Institute, PhD in pharmacology, she knows how to do controlled studies, you do controlled mm -hmm. studies on whether mediums can reliably deliver information to people who are grieving and the data just comes through again and again they can we don't understand the mechanism we don't understand what it means to be deceased and to have consciousness that's deceased but we do it, it does but then the follow-on to her study that i find incredibly incredibly relevant is that hey and if you lost a dog you can communicate with that dog too in a way that's again in every way that we can measure it 
straight up, you know, doing science. And, and, and science says, if we can observe it, we can measure it. There's no taboo to say, well, you can't measure after death communication in science. Sure as shit can, just set up the experiment, mm -hmm. set up the controls. What are you observing? Measure it, control it, control it, control it, and at the end. So we don't really have an idea of, and it inter interfaces with your world too. It's like, can silicone be conscious? Well, let's start with, can your cat be conscious? Can your dog be conscious? Most people who've ever had an animal say, of course, I know it is. But there's right. a whole bunch of questions that get tied in here. What do you think about Shut Up and Calculate? I think if you look, if in fact, there was an interesting survey among physicists a few years ago who I think they tried to get at this question and ask them, you know, like, what about indeterminacy? What about randomness? Uh, what about, you know, uh, entanglement? And, and all these different interpretations of, of quantum theory. And I think a, a large, you know, a large percentage of physicists don't, you know, are reluctant to commit to a, an interpretation, you know, because it does, for, it's like, you know, the, this, the, the, the shut up and that most of them are just in the, sh they do just shut up and calculate because that's how you publish papers and get tenure and Get paid. You know, you, you get a paycheck. Yeah, you get a paycheck, and like that's it. And we, and like you said, we we're making these advances. You know, maybe at this point incrementally, and and like there's some, there's a great book by Sabine um, Hosenfelder about. Uh, it's called Lost in Math, about how physics is so obsessed with beautiful equations that empirically we've like made no progress since the 70s, <laughs> and because they're all obsessed with supersymmetry and like they but they can't find it, but they keep smashing particles. And they're like, this has to be true. You know what I mean? That, that these because the equations are so beautiful, uh, but but they just the the empirical support for a lot of the the stuff is not there. What do you think about sure. that? Because like I've had some awesome interviews with uh, physicists. Donald Hoffman yeah. is kind of one of my favorites. You know, kind of saying, you know, the deal. You know, and there's kind of no reality. And here's my mathematical model to prove it, kind of thing, which is kind of a oxymoron in a way, but your field, I think to anyone who really is willing to go there is the most in your face counter argument to a lot of that uh, myth of progress kind of stuff, which I hear, you know, oh, we're not really progressing, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. man, Alpha Go, uh, to, uh, to tell people, right, 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 right. Tell, tell people of the broad sketch, the Alpha Go story. Google bought DeepMind, um, few years ago uh, for a lot of money uh, and they use um, right and and you know like you mentioned deep blue and the you know initially people thought chess would be you know kind of an insurmountable obstacle for an, for an AI and that proved not to be true and then I mean there is this interesting dichotomy I think where you know there's the famous um, um, story about Marvin Minsky, who was one, you know, one of these early AI people from the sixties. And he, he like assigned, he assigned the problem of computer vision to like a summer intern. And, and they, you know, back in, they were like, Oh, computer vision, we're going to solve that in the summer with an intern, you know, and here we are 56 years later. It's like, well, we're, we're no, you know, we're, we're, we're closer, but like, it's, it's. And so the problems that we thought were going to be really hard, like chess, and, and go turned out to be easier than the like than getting a robot to like open a car door like we there's I don't know if you follow these DARPA challenges or like you know I mean you have these Boston Dynamics things with the dancing robots but like you still can't you still there's no we're very far away from having a robot that you could say like oh go go to the fridge and get me a, a, a beer there's there's no there's no robot that could do that without destroying you know what i mean like it would it would have to be like this very controlled circum so like now you know just the stuff humans take for granted in terms of motion and moving around are like in insanely difficult from a robotics and and like a phys but then anyway alpha go was go is this very old game that's very complicated it has a lot of dimensions and possible moves and the, and the, everyone's like oh okay chess it's relatively simple actually if you you can just it's this combinatorial problem of all the rules and like if you have this massive supercomputer of course it can churn through all the possible moves in milliseconds while a human can't you know that was the explanation and then they're like but go 
that's out, you know, no way. Cause that's way too, that's even more complicated than chess. The rules are fuzzy and like, but then, yeah, they, you, what, so DeepMind used uh, what they call reinforcement learning, which is, it's based on, you know, theories about how humans learn through reward function. It's, it's a quite a simple, you know, you give it a, a you give someone a goal and you reward them as they get close to the goal and punish them as they move away. And this is like operant conditioning, B of Skinner type stuff. And then when you combine that reinforcement learning idea with deep neural networks and you can get the machine to play millions and millions of games, then you can, so you, it turns out you can engineer a system that will beat autonomously beat a human at go. Um, and it's not, it's not brute, it's not to, it's so, it's still a bit of a brute force approach. Like I think the chess, the chess game is just brute forcing, just brute forcing all the possibilities and arriving at that. You know what I mean? Before a human, a human can't brute force chess or go. It's all, it's much more of an intuitive sense, but the, but the computer systems, you can brute force it to a degree and then use reinforcement learning to get it the rest of the way. And, and what was, you know, it was really interesting because AlphaGo came up with moves that, as far as anyone could tell, a hum no human has ever tried. And everyone was like, oh my God, how did it, how did it do that? You know, and that, that's still kind of a interesting problem of like, we don't really understand how it arrived at the winning moves when it, when it beat Lee Sedol. So there's, you know, these systems do have these interesting properties and like you mentioned emergence before you know there's there's things that emerge out of these systems that are happening that we that the, even the engineers and the and the the people who developed it didn't can't anticipate they're like wow that's that's crazy it did that you know even though they're the ones who coded it you know what i mean and so and that's uh, the part that scares people right it, it people, scares people right away when you even mention bf skinner as kind of a model for how you would program a self-learning thing. And then when you scale that and you say, okay, so we got, and then you get, you, you, you force yourself to be comfortable with the idea that it's doing reward and punishment. And you go, yeah, but then we just had it do it to itself. And it just ran millions and millions of trials on itself. And you know, the, oh, whoa. And then the other thing, you know, comment on this too. So the AlphaGo, like you say, it generates thinking, for lack of a better term, that we couldn't really have anticipated. And then the humans look at the problem different and go, whoa, one of the things I learned from yeah. the computer is that I don't have to smash everybody at go. All I have to do is win by half a point. And that's, I mean, you know, less, and this is an emerging area of research too, where um, I, there's a few studies, I think, on you know, working with the machines. So the, the machines alone have faults and, and, and weaknesses and blind spots. Humans have faults and weaknesses and blind spots. And the idea would be when you, when you work to get like with alpha, like if you work together, like a human alpha go system would just be completely unbeatable. And this is the thinking with um, diagnostics or like, let's not, let's not say like, Oh, radiologists are, irrelevant now or obsolete because we have deep learning on cat scans you know and and, and it's it's turn you know th there's a lot of studies showing that there's a lot of weaknesses with automated diagnostic systems but then like let's let's have a human there and the, like let's use the po the things that the human can't do which is like shuffle through gazillions of data points and process all these images and look for patterns but then you you know complement that with the human ability to see still to use in intuition and and judgment and like uh so you know social context and all of the things that we still don't know how to get a computer to understand and so it's this hybrid you know like this sort of hybrid you know i think there's people are like oh the, the machines are going to take over and it's and it's like well no i mean we sh we should cooperate <laughs> basically is the because yeah like like with go where it's like oh they the machine showed us something that we human did never occurred to humans, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Although, you know, all those things kind of break down because you say, well, that's, 
clearly that's an intermediate step, right? I mean, and we've seen those steps before. So, the, the, yeah. the, which kind of gets to the belly of the beast questions that we really do have to talk about because, I mean, folks, again, I'm telling you, you don't know how awesome it is to have Andrew Smart with us today because he is at the edge and his job at Google and his job at, you were at Twitter before that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, these are really the cutting edge, the cutting, cutting edge of these kind of questions, because you're now looking at it from a social, ethical, legal yeah. uh, kind of perspective. And we can really, you know, put the boxing gloves on about that and have completely different opinions about where it's going. But we cannot disagree that that's where the action is. So uh, frame up, uh, you know, what you do, what you have done in the past. I think you have a little bit of a different job at Google now, but you know, those issues, you know, I mean, the good and the bad, the, you know, let's make sure our search is uh, socially just and uh, the bad, you know, let's censor the shit out of anyone who doesn't agree with us, you know, and those would be the two polar extremes. Yeah, those, I mean, and that's, that's really what we're, I, so I, I think that with any technology, you know, in, in history, you've had this, you know, rapid advancements, and then you you typically have catastrophes and disasters, which lead to people going like, oh, we, we need like for fly, you know, with aviation, you know, it, it, within 100 years now, it, it we had it flying used to be this kind of fantastical, crazy dream. And now it's like this mundane thing that everyone totally takes for granted. But it took decades of of manufacturers of companies and governments and regulators working together to make commercial flying safe enough where people are like, Oh yeah, I'll, I hop on a plane without even, I don't even worry about it. But that behind the scenes, it's, you know, it's this very, very complicated, um, constant vigilance type of, of safety practices that have been learned over decades. So just, just for example. And so with AI and machine learning, it's a similar thing where we're in this, rapid expansion of investment and the, everyone is like this is amazing stuff and we're gonna you know and now we're kind of coming to terms with like there are downsides there are risks and we need we need to understand better how these systems especially on a scale of of google you know of google um how how do these things interact how do these you know how are they influenced by society how do they change society and how do we yeah prevent harm basically from these things um, or how, how do we govern the development of them resp re responsibly basically that's and, and again these are terms these are hard to define and hard to let me frame it up and pin it down in one way and it would be the freedom of speech censorship freedom of the press issue so this is mm -hmm. a fundamental fundamental issue here you got some people on one side saying you know, these are platforms that we would consider throughout our lives as being freedom of the press, that somehow there is speech, free speech being done there, and that should not be inhibited in, in some ways. And all this stuff gets very fuzzy. So if we just frame that as, as the problem, then I thought well, what we should probably do further is help have you help us understand your problem from an AI standpoint. I mean, you're talking about lots and lots of data content mm -hmm. at a level that's unimaginable and mm -hmm. lots of legitimate concerns. You know, you have illegal activity, you have activity that, that anyone would find morally reprehensible, you know, people trafficking kids or exploiting other people and stuff like that. So what am I missing in terms of framing kind of, okay, here's the issue, but then here's what people maybe don't appreciate about how hard that is for you as a, you know, as a Google guy. Yeah, well, I, I agree. I mean, and there's, yeah, I mean, we, there's, there's definitely very tightly regulated things where, you know, you, you are obligated legally to get rid of certain types of things like, or, you know, and so, but then I, I agree that I, the, the free speech question is very hard. And I, and like, I, like you mentioned, I used to work, I did work at Twitter for a year right after the election and when it was like, 
misinformation was suddenly, you know, like, in, what, what is, you know, no, that really blindsided the tech industry. Um, that, that would be really highly, like, highly controversial, <laughs> right? That, I mean, that would be, that is the belly of the beast. I mean, misinformation yeah. was, it yeah. was and is <laughs> the question, you know, everyone's, yeah. one I, guy's misinformation is another guy's information. So, yeah. Right, exactly. And that's where, that's where all these questions of like, what's our shared reality? You know, what's our, what, and, and do, is there such a thing? And like, it, you, then you, I, you know, it overlaps with all these philosophical questions we were talking about before, where you, then you go back into some kind of relativism where there, you know, yeah, like you're saying, each, each perspective is equally valid or, you know, there are like, is there such a thing as false belief or like, are, you know, can you be wrong? <laughs> and I think the scientific spirit would be like, yeah, everything you know is probably wrong and you should keep trying to prove yourself wrong. <laughs> you know, and that's, the 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 and Feynman I think too like you mentioned before would be a very strong proponent of like you should be absolutely prepared at every moment to reject everything you think you know and and so given that you know what I mean give it and then there's debates about like okay so what counts as evidence and you you can't interpret your evidence unless you have some kind of theory about what you think evident good evidence is and and but anyway sorry that's uh, no, no, no. That's I, that's spot on. I, if I can, I'll, I'll kind of frame it up yeah. in a more concrete way, just yeah. so we're all talking about the same thing. Let's say the president came out tomorrow and started beating the war drums against China, which is completely just a thought experiment, you know, but he's just he's not announcing we're going to war. He's just going, man, fuck those Chinese. And, you know, they Taiwan, we need to produce, you know, and just starts doing all the stuff that various administrations have done over time and will do for so let's say the day after that our friends at google youtube facebook twitter kind of independently announced that hey we're really down with the president on this and as a matter of fact you know people who are against this policy you know all you commies out there and all you uh, you know China lovers mm. and all that stuff, you know, just expect, but let me put you on notice, you know, that's not, we're really down with the president's new position. So the reason that thought experiment, here's the thing that, that kind of grabs me is 10 years ago, we'd all be like, you can't do that. You can't uh, go Google. You can't do that. YouTube, you can't do that, which is Google, but mm. Facebook, Twitter, you, you guys can't do that. And you especially can't kind of get together in some kind of organized way, even though you're saying it's not organized and do that. I mean, you can't do that. This is what we've always maintained is special about America and our freedom of press. So, so I guess, I guess the pushback and I'm going to be the one pushing back is when I hear you talk about wokeness issues and social justice and all mm -hmm. of that, I'm like, screw that, man. Stop censoring people mm -hmm. or, or at least be transparent. Yeah, I mean, we, the transparency issue is something we we work a lot on. And what the the pro, the thing is, is that the it's it's really an issue of like and again, I'm not that in that position where I have insight into that. Totally fair. That, yeah, yeah. I'm not putting you. Yeah, you're not representing. You know. You're not I, carrying I, I, this whole thing, you know? No, I, I mean, I have, of course, I have my own thoughts about it, but then I don't have, yeah, I'm not, I, like, the the sort of, I think what the, the policy issues are around, how, like, yeah, and, and it does, you know, there's this debate around, should the companies be responsible for the content on the thing? And and the, the problem is that Google doesn't have, or YouTube, or, you know, they're not, relative to the number of people using it, it's actually a very tiny workforce <laughs> in terms of, which is which is the idea because that's why these systems are scale, you, the systems are scalable and they make a lot of money because they're so scalable. Well, this is and also the, the AI app, issue. This is the AI issue, right? This yeah, is why you're- Automating, you can't automate these decisions. It's very, very hard. But you have to so automate I mean, these, you have to, you already are and you have to continue exactly. to. Because, well, because of the scale, you know, because you have billions of people every day, you know, the servers are handling trillions of requests per second and down, you know, and you obviously you can't have human eyes on that 
you know what I mean? It's just, even if you, you know, I don't even know if it's possible. If, even if Google says, all right, we're investing in content moderation and we're going to hire, you, you'd have to hire literally, I don't know, millions of people. <laughs> and so that the autom- there's the automation stage of it, which um, you, you try to monitor, but I mean, the whole, the, like Google's, you know, the, the thing is like, they, the idea is like, we want to serve everybody, you know, and that, and how do you make this am- information accessible to everybody? But I agree, it comes at this, at this um, cost of how do you, you know, like if you, if you take it to an, another, you know, if you do have an adversarial government or it, it, anyway, I agree, it's all, it's, it's really relative to your perspective, but like deliberately misleading people um what should you know what should your and i agree with the even you know but for you know free speech does have limits of course too and there's and there's lots of different legal regimes around the world that are far more restrictive than than we have and i don't you know and there's there's all these and like i said before about this being a publisher versus this platform and like are are we if you find some something on that that has moved through the system um does do we have does google have some kind of responsibility for what and so i think the arguments from a lot of the sectors are like yes you need to take responsibility for a lot of this horrible crap that is on your platforms and so the but then the question is how do you balance that with yeah like you're saying the free like allowing an open and free internet where you know there there, there is a lot, you know, there is um, a lot of like difficult information and, and stuff to deal with. So I don't, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have a, I, I wish I had a better, I don't have a good answer to that. I mean, that's, these are problems that are being worked on. <laughs> I, I think that is the answer. And, and I mean, I think this is what we're trying to work out as a society, you know, and wrestle to the ground. And as you point out, they always have been the issues, you know, this freedom of the press issue, this has been around forever, ever since, you know, Benjamin yeah. Franklin was point, you know, pumping them out. And but and then it got to be, well, we have these three networks. And you know, what are their responsibilities? And it's only three networks, then we had this explosion of cable news. And it's, then it, it morphed into something else where partisanship was okay. And now it's kind of morphing into something else. And I, I think we do have to acknowledge what you're uh, what i think you really bring here and I, i'm so again grateful that you've you know are, are so open in talking about this like one thing i really want to drive a stake in the ground is the problem the problem which you frame up nicely which is like okay dude but trillions trillions of requests okay so there ain't no easy answer here uh, any way you cut it you know now, I right. think the concern that people have is, well, don't tell me put my trust in Google either, you know, because I, I tell you, like one of the things I find, you know, kind of most disturbing on the edge, but it, it, it plays, you know, it all kind of sorts itself out. So I don't want to kind of sound the alarm bells too much, but I got a friend, a guy who's been on the show, Luke Rutkowski. And he has a kind of semi-popular website. It's called uh, We Are Change. So he's a 9-11 guy. You know, 9-11 was an inside job. And he's still there. He's not banned. A lot of the other guys that say that are banned. But he's not banned. But what he was was demonetized. And he was demonetized in 2015 before there was even such a word. And he just, he just did videos on it. He was like, here's my video. Here's, my, here's all my videos. Here they are last month. Here they are now. They're demonetized. There's no explanation for why they're demonetized. There's no process. There's no guidelines. They're demonetized. Or go over on Twitter and they're shadow banned. Oh, your tweets? Oh, well, they're reaching one tenth of the audience than they used to. We don't admit that they do. When someone goes in and forensically proves that, we just, so, these, I, I think the issue really, I think the issue is, is, is two. One is transparency. And the second mm-hmm. issue I take from my business background is the, it's called the fuck you pay me issue, which is like, I get to sue your fucking ass 
And if you've, you know, not done it right, then I get to get paid. And then Mm. you have to, which is fair, you have to defend yourself from any legislation that would make it easier for me to do that. And then I have to try and do that. And that is, I'm not trying to do that to be like adversarial with you. I'm just saying, this is how business has always resolved you know, these issues, if you think they're Mm. dumping chemicals into the love canal, and it's killing your kids, well, then you you sue them. And then Dow Chemical does everything they can to prevent people from prevailing. And then eventually the legal system kind of meanders to some space that we get. So I, I know I let a lot on the table there, but the transparency, and then the uh, financial responsibility, if it doesn't you know, live up to our standards of what fairness is. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's definitely, I mean, I would say, I mean, I, I don't, I can't, I don't know those, that case or, you know, and I don't, so I don't, and like, I, like I said, I have no thousands business. and thousands just search. There's thousands of those cases, yeah. thousands uh, of them. Yeah. Or any of, I mean, cause I, I don't work in that, in, in that area, but like, I think there's a, you know, I think you do have to, and this is again where the difficult part about the shared reality and like have some kind of standards for what you and and again this is a it's a conundrum because like the scale and the size of google is and and the idea is like to be able to serve you know serve everybody but then coming up with like responsible like what are the guidelines what are the standards for what kind of things can live on the platform. And like you're saying, there's these, there's these things everyone would agree on child trafficking ch- stuff. Like no, that, you know what I mean? There's just stuff that's like, everyone would be like, that's awful. But then I agree as you move into these different areas, it's really, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to draw the line. You know, do I think people have a right to publish work on conspiracy theories and like, discuss these different things of obvious you know of course i don't i don't think that should be like legally restricted i don't but then whether you know whether like a private company like google has a responsibility yeah you know if like and again people bring up then it's this private company issue it's like if you want to use the services like here's the terms and i and these are these are not and i agree with the, the transparency like it's it's almost like you don't it's like uh, you don't put you don't put uh, speed limit signs up and then you'd be like you're speeding, you 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 know what I mean like the I agree with the tra- the rules have to be but the the rules are changing and and it's it's trying to respond to these different. I mean I'm definitely not a free speech absolutist in that sense and I don't but I don't I mean I don't know. Yeah I wish. I, the, pff, I don't have I don't have better <laughs> answers than that. Well, well, as we move towards wrapping it up, yeah. let me ask you a question more relevant to your job. Yeah, you know, take this discussion we're having. What parts of it are particularly relevant, interesting, pressing, and interesting to you? You know, because you're such a thinker, and anyone who reads this this mm-hmm. book, and I do encourage you to pick up this book. It's really fantastic. And if you want to know how some of the thought leaders, I hate to use that term, but how some of the people who are really trying to wrestle these issues to the ground, how they're thinking, and some of the novel ways that you wouldn't have anticipated, then pick up Beyond Zero and One, Machines, Psychedelics, and Consciousness. But then, so Andrew, yeah, what do you find interesting about this discussion we've been having relative to your job, because you do, yeah. I, I didn't mean to discount it, you do care about social issues and you yeah. you have an issue of, oh, hey, let's make sure we're being, let's make sure we're being fair there too. And you, you wanna speak to, to how, how that relates to what you think you can do to make the world a better place with AI and these kind of yeah. things. Well, yeah, my, I mean, I'm really interested in what people talk about as like these so- socio-technical systems. So it's it, not looking narrowly at technical failure in, in, you know, Google's machine learning things, but like more a holistic view of the interaction of our systems with yeah society and, and, and what, and the, you know, like the issues you're talking about are, are, are super important too, but 
mainly what we what we're trying to do is understand um, sort of the if if you look at the une you know you look at inequality for example or the the way society is structured and the and the way things run go you know there's all this data that is sampled from that social structure uh, upon which these models are trained and then they're making predictions people are taking that information sometimes and using it you know to do things which generates more data and it's kind of this feedback loop and what we're trying to understand is how do we intervene so that we're not just blindly reproducing uh, or recapitulating discrimination or uh, unfair, unfair allocation of resources or like bring that down to a practical level that people might be under might be able to kind of grasp well, I mean, I think you can look at, I mean, so just, just a real, uh, um, I guess it's a pretty clear example to me where you have, so, and, and take facial recognition software, which is in your phone to unlock it sometimes, or like it's used in a lot of different domains. There's a lot of controversy about it, but one clear lesson from a lot of work that, that my colleagues and I ha do is like, you train these systems and you have you have a giant database of photographs, and you have these you you feed these to the neural networks. They learn what a face looks like, and then they then they can pretty accurately predict. Oh, it's Al. You know, I, I see these pixels, and I know that's Alex. I or with you know eighty nine percent whatever, ninety. So the the problem was that these databases, these training data sets, were mostly white people, mostly white men. So when you use these systems. And they tend to be used more often on darker skin people for lots of reasons. They, they're like a chance and they, they, they don't, either they don't see the face, it's the wrong face, it's misrecognized. And it's like, everyone goes, well, what's going on here? And it's like, well, it, it turns out like nobody thought like, oh, what if, you know, if we, use, if we don't, if we only have white faces in the database and then we use it on dark people, it's probably not gonna work as, as well. And it's, it's these kinds of things in retrospect seem super obvious. Like, well, obviously you, you've got to train it on the diversity of faces that you'll ultimately use the system on. But this these are not things that people had to force. And so what we're trying to develop is like for these systems, like are you, you know, are, are these things kind of representative of the people that you're, that will be interacting with this and will it work for them in the same way? The, the question of whether you should, I mean, I'm, you know, there's this other question of like not using this at all because it's inherently problematic and. No, we can't go backwards. Violent. We can't go backwards. So yeah. it's beautiful. Well, okay. well, it's a beautiful example. Yeah. So, and that's, but you, you th that kind of problem is, is rife through all machine learning <laughs> where you're, you're training, you're training your models on this very narrow type of person and then using that to make predictions about different types of people and. It, it, it doesn't work. Equally true in search, right? Equally true, same problem in search, yes. there, same problem of, everywhere. Yeah. So everywhere. Yeah, and it is, it, it, to me, it's this it's this problem of scale. And uh, I don't, you know, I, that's, a, it's a, that's a hard, you know, the tech industry is predicated on scale. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that that's great. That's a great yeah. example. But it reminds me of the stop and frisk cases in New York. There were a lot of people, particularly in some minority communities, that said, hey, the cops stop us a lot more than they stop other people on the street and they can frisk us. You know, no, 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 that doesn't happen. Well, when they actually get the data, yeah, they did. And yeah. that's twice as likely and less likely to actually find an in you know, like a gun or stuff like that. So it's only, it's it's another form of data. It's only when you get the data and you go, ooh, wow, I guess the system has been systemically biased in a way. And yeah. so very, very uh, excellent that you would point out face recognition as a part of that because it's directly, it, it's it's perfect. So Andrew, what, what's next? You you are an excellent author. Your book is super well written and you have another book as well. Do you have another one in the works? Are you going to do that I, or just know, stay do, with your I, day job? You know, my, my sort of, yeah, I mean, I'm a researcher, so I get, I write papers now, you know, and on this, these kinds of issues and publish work. So that kind of takes up my writing. I mean, I, yeah, I don't, I don't have any, I don't have really a book 
uh, I, I'm interested, you know, I'm, I, I'm interested in like pursuing m more of these, these questions around, you know, yeah, like the technical systems and understanding complex complexity theory and um, things like that. But I, yeah, I'm always, yeah, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I guess I'm a curious and easily distractible person. So I get interested in different things and then they're kind of obsessive. Well, yeah, I'm sure you, you know, and then, but I, yeah, my, my job keeps me very interested and busy for sure. Well, let's hope you remain just as curious as you've been. Our guest again has been uh, Andrew Smart, the book you're going to want to check out, Beyond Zero and One. Terrific having you on. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Andrew Smart for joining me today on Skeptico. One question I tee up from this interview, why does AI seem to be blind to the metaphysical question of consciousness, which, as I kind of put forth in this interview, is the only game in town. It's the only question to ask. And, uh, you know, the next level on that question is, well, the spiritual question. And you have to wonder if that's why they don't answer part A is because they don't really want to answer part B. So... I mean, to break that down even further, I guess, so it isn't totally inside baseball, if you think consciousness is an illusion and you're going to play the shut up and calculate game, which is the only game in town for AI, and uh, Andrew kind of threads the needle there a little bit, but at the end of the day, it's the only game in town. Consciousness is an illusion. Consciousness is an epiphenomenon of the brain. That's where you got to be if you're doing AI. You're doing AI at Google or Facebook or Twitter, or more importantly, a DARPA or NSA or wherever you're doing it. Anyways, so that's question number one. But then question number two is, if consciousness is not an illusion, then what is the hierarchy of consciousness? Like I always say, like the fucking God question, you know, kind of. Does E.T., have an NDE question. These are the real questions, but you wouldn't want to talk about any of that stuff if you're doing AI. If your job was to just do a better AlphaGo machine learning and apply it to search and everything else that'll make billions and billions of dollars and drive up the stock price. I own a lot of Google stock, man. Drive it up, drive it up. Let me know your thoughts. Skeptical Forum, come on over, play. Lots more to come. Stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.